Go ahead. Hello, my name is Marianne Holden, and I'm really happy to be here with these amazing people who all have wonderful gifts to share. Today, I would like to present something that's very useful in this time that we're going through right now. As we all know, we are in some precarious times and many of us are dealing with it a little bit differently. I know for me personally, I have good days and I have not so good days. And it's, I really need to, you know, needed to learn how to manage my own emotions throughout this time, especially. And stress being one of the major things that people experience during times like this. Being a yoga teacher and being a um, meditation teacher as well, I think breathing techniques are one of the most useful things that we can use to help us maintain a level of peace and tranquility in our everyday life. So sure, it works good for you know a good few minutes when you're doing it, but if done on a regular basis, your overall level of peace and calmness seems to be what your normal what you normally feel and that's a really good thing to have that you know for yourself especially now so today I would practice something that I do with my yoga students and it's a very useful technique it's called the 478 breathing technique and it can be used when you are ready to get angry. It can be used when you can't fall asleep at night and you're, you know, your, your mind is going and going. It's very effective. I know that when I'm with my grandchildren and I, they always ask me to put them to bed and I always ask them to take these deep breaths in and I'm rubbing their backs and I'm telling you by their third deep breath, they're, they're fast asleep. It's a really amazing ability to be able to manage stress on your own. So this technique I worked, I learned from Dr. Andrew Weil. He's a naturopathic physician. You can find him on YouTube and you can learn this technique with him. He'll teach it, but I've done it so much now. I love teaching it. So how this begins is that we are going to breathe in through the nose for a count of four. We are going to pause breath with a, for a count of seven. And then we are going to exhale strongly out through the mouth for a count of eight. There's one thing that seems to work very well is if you place the tip of your tongue behind your top front teeth very lightly. It's not like you have to do it that way, but when you do, it seems to kind of bring an energy, a different energy to it. We start by first blowing the air out, and then we begin by breathing in for four, holding for seven, and then exhaling for eight. Now, I'm going to do this with you if you're all up to for the challenge, it's very simple. You can even close your eyes if you'd like because it'll bring a little bit more peace to you. And I'll do the counting and it's four breath cycles. So if you're ready and you'd like to join me, I'll do the counting and I'd love you to participate to try it. So let's begin by placing the, the tip of the tongue behind the top front teeth and exhaling strongly through the mouth. Exhaling all the air out. Now through the nose, begin to breathe in. One, two, three, four. Pause, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Inhale through the nose, two, three, four. Pause, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Inhale, two, three, four. 
pause two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One more, inhale, two, three, four. Pause, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And now just breathe normally. Usually when I'm doing this breathing technique, it gives me a really calm, altered state of mind. And sometimes it's hard to come back and start continuing with your conversation. If it's the first time you've ever done it, it feels a little odd. Somebody in the background counting and you really don't get to relax. The truth is putting on some nice calm music and doing this is very, very advantageous. I love doing it in, when I go to sleep at night. So what Dr. Andrew Wilde does recommend is that you do, you practice this because anything, like anything else, it works best when done consistently. So the recommend, recommendation is to do four breath cycles in the morning upon awakening, and then four breath cycles at bedtime. Many people, if they do meditate, meditate in the morning. It's a good preparation for meditation. Also, another very good thing that this will help with, Dr. Andrew Weil has used it for his patients it, for years. And what he has seen is that it reduces anxiety so much that his patients that have atrial fib, which is a very common um, arrhythmia to the, to the heart where your heart beats irregularly and usually it's stress that causes that. He teach his patients this so they don't have to run to the emergency room every time they have an episode of AFib. Now, I've done this breathing technique for years now and I highly, highly recommend that you give it a try. And if you don't remember how to do it, simply go to YouTube Look up Dr. Andrew Weil and check him out. You'll learn a lot from this technique. In participating and learning any of the techniques from beginner level all the way up to a vinyasa flow, I love teaching and it's really come into my life during a very stressful time years ago. That's why I got started. So I'm, you know, that's one one of the things I do, I'm also a holistic health coach. I work in um, nutrition mainly to help people who are, I particularly like to work with people as they're aging to help prevent the obvious signs of aging. So that's something I really love to do. So thank you very much. It was nice being here. Okay, go ahead. Okay. My name is Lindsay Collier. Uh, I, I echo what Marianne had to say. I'm, a, I'm honored to be a part of this group. This is a great group, a nice, a diverse group of wonderful speakers, and we're all very different. My story is a little different as well. I've had, uh, I guess I would say, three careers. My first career was as a, as a uh, captain in the, in the Army Corps of Engineers. I was in that for a few years and, de and decided that uh, that probably wasn't what I wanted to do all my life. So I then uh, went out to Rochester, New York, and I worked for Eastman Kodak Company. You remember them, don't you? Uh, as a mechanical engineer. And I was with them for 25 years. While I was there, uh, I became very enamored with the whole idea of creative thinking and also humor in the workplace. And I began to study those two the areas. And I became Kodak's expert on creative thinking. And I also became somewhat of an expert on humor in the workplace and actually built the first uh, corporate human room at Kodak. But I left there, took an early retirement, and I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about myself here, but I took an early retirement uh, because I kind of saw the writing on the wall, I guess, that Kodak might not be around for that much longer. Uh, and I started to get into speaking and writing books, two things I, that I love to do. I've written a dozen books, and I've got the 13th one hopefully coming out sometime pretty soon. And most of my presentations, I actually all of my presentations are based on uh, the books that I've written. The first books that I wrote were on uh, creativity and innovation, obviously. And I call that my creativity and innovation series. Oh, what a, what a creative title. 
anyway, I don't, I do talk about that still, but not very much because, hey, we're in the villages. We're older. We're not into creative thinking at this point. We're into some other things. So I started using some of this creative thinking to put together books that took a creative look at a number of aspects of life. And I developed a series of books. Oh, there's probably five or six books in there at this point in time, uh, which I, I called uh, my Living Your Life to the Fullest series. This is what I talk about generally. I, and I'm not going to mention all of these, but th like one of the books is called How to Live Happily Ever After, 12 Things You Can Do to Live Forever. And by the way, this book is guaranteed. If you don't live forever, you get your money back. So I mean, that's a pretty good deal when you come right down to it. Now, I have a, a talk on that. I do that quite often in clubs around here. I do talk on other items. I, I, I have a talk coming up on kindness. My next book is called Kindness Rocks, and it's all about kindness. And I've developed an incredible amount of information on kindness. And actually, we have a club in the, in the villages, villages, villages called the Acknowledging Acts of Kindness Club. I also do a talk on uh, surviving the loss of a loved one. And uh, this is based on a book I wrote called Surviving the Loss of a Loved One that I wrote when I lost my uh, wife of 40 years to ovarian cancer. And the day after, a large rainbow surrounded my house. That inspired me to write this very comforting book about loss. Uh, it's one of my best sellers. And I've, I've had the pleasure of helping maybe hundreds of people, kind of giving them comfort in their loss. But overall, the book that is probably in fact, I don't know if I could show a book here. Hey, I just did, but it's backwards on my screen. It's called Add Humor to Your Life, Add Life to Your Humor. Overall, the most, uh, the most uh, asked for presentation on my part is all about humor. And who doesn't need humor, particularly in these, in these days? The, the uh, talk I usually call uh, How to Be a Glutton for Funishment. And it's a, it's a fun talk. It's a lot of laughs, a lot of smiles you're guaranteed to leave with a smile. And what I do is I get into the, the nature of humor, some, and some of these things about humor might interest you a lot. I get into uh, uh, why humor is so important to you. And in a nutshell, I mean, there's a long list of why humor is so important, but obviously it, may, it makes you healthier in so many ways. Uh, it keeps you, uh, it helps you think, particularly think creatively. And one of the reasons I got into humor was I found that uh, with all the creative sessions I did, the more people laughed, the more creative they were. And just I, that I learned from experience. Uh, humor helps you in relations with others and humor helps you cope with change, with grief, with all sorts of things. So the main thing that I talk about in this session are techniques that you can use to really uh, supercharge your humor. And I, I'll just get into one of the techniques, for example. And I call it uh, finding your mindset, your smile mindset. What do I mean by smile mindset? Everyone has one, two, or three, or four, maybe more things in their lifetime that made them laugh until they almost cried. Something that really, really was a, some of the funniest things that ever happened to you. The idea is to try to put those in your mind and try to be able to bring them out when you can. So what I do is I say, well, I'm gonna think of one particular thing that was so funny that I almost started crying. And I, when I squeeze my right ear or left ear, whatever, whichever the ear that is, uh, I will be, be able to bring that up. So if I'm in a situation where I'm sad or I'm unhappy or I'm stressed out or whatever, uh, I can bring up that particular smile mindset. As an example, my oldest son went to Buffalo uh, University. He came over one weekend and we were sitting down just yakking. We were watching television, which is something we really did, watching a show, a game show, and I think it was Jeopardy. And someone, the MC said something like, you know, the first, first place winner will, will win all the prizes. The second or third place winner will get a year's supply of rice of roni. Now that's not all that funny, but my son just could not stop laughing. That became one of his smile mindsets. And to this day, and that was, <laughs> I hate to say it, probably 30, 35 years ago. To this day, if he came to my house, he looked sad, and I, I, I'd say, hey, Steve, rice a roni, he would suddenly feel happy again. So that's just one technique. In the, in the glutton, how to be a glutton for punishment 
sessions that I do. We have a lot of laughs. I have a lot of great videos. And like I said, everyone leaves with a big smile on their face, face and la usually laughing. And I go through all these different techniques and we just have a blast. So anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang it up for now. And uh, you can find my, uh, my uh, Amazon author page, which is amazon.com slash author slash Lindsay Collier. And if you walk, go to that page, you'll see all my books. And you also see a feed from one of my blogs, a blog on growing young. So that's all I have for now. And thanks for listening. And Go ahead. Hi, I'm Dan Capellan, and I have a passion to help people attain their dreams. I specialize in working with small businesses, but my presentations are of value to anyone who wants to pursue a winning vision in their life. Today, I will offer three tips to achieve your goals. First, identify your need. Second, act on motivation to satisfy that need. And third, change behaviors that will help you sustain your journey. Without thinking, we create ruts for ourselves. What rut do you want to get out of? What rut do you want to change course on? Ruts don't just happen with humans. I grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin. During the summer, it was my job to rouse the cows from their pastures to the barn every evening for milking. Despite wide spaces for them to trek from one side of the field to the other, they always took the same path. And soon it became a well-worn path, which was muddy when it rained. As humans, we're like that too. We tend to keep following the same path and then wonder why we end up in the same mental state at the end of the day when we know we want more out of life. If you don't think that we as humans are the same as cows, just go to any college and look at the grass lawns. You see many well-worn paths. And I often wonder why tax money is even spent on sidewalks. Okay, let's get back on subject here. So let's say you identify a need. If you're a business, you might need more revenue. If you're obese, you might need to lose weight. If you feel overwhelmed, you might need to improve your time management. If you keep in the same rut, nothing will change. So the first step is identify the need that you want to change. If you're like me, you've probably got a dozen things that need changing, but just focus on one thing, not on two or three. The second step is to think about changing your actions to get the result you want. A powerful book called Atomic Actions by author James Clear advises finding ways to make change easy. He has several different suggestions, but for tonight, I'm just going to focus on one. For example, let's say that you want to lose weight. The easy thing is to change your environment. And by that, I mean, don't store unhealthy foods in the house or foods that will cause you to gain weight. Because if you get hungry and you feel motivated to get something to eat, you will likely be less motivated to drive to the store and buy a bag of potato chips than to go to the refrigerator and crunch on that celery stick you or your spouse so lovingly put in the refrigerator. The third step to sustain your journey to change is to change your behaviors, to change your habits. And the way to do that is a little bit at a time. It requires a bit of planning, for example, you know what I said, put celery in the refrigerator if you want to lose weight instead of cookies in the cupboard. It requires a commitment to action. Uh, James Clear in his book tells a story about a guy who wanted to start running. 
And he started by doing nothing more than waking up and putting on his running shoes. Then he would remove the running shoes, get dressed, go to work. And then after a bit of time, he would get out, he'd take a walk around the block. And after more time, he actually ran around the block and he did more and more and more each day until he was fit enough to run a marathon. During a longer presentation, I offer many more ideas. I go into more depth and I tell a few more jokes that sometimes take time, sometimes um, maybe are a little bit on the off color side, so to speak. But um, I'll recap right here, you know, what you want for positive, sustainable change. Number one, identify your need, work on one at a time. Number two, act on motivation to satisfy that need and make that need easy to satisfy. Make it the right thing to satisfy. And finally, change your behavior, change your habits to sustain your journey. It's actually not as hard as you think. I'm Dan Capellan. I'm a Villages resident who applies his experience to that of a speaker, writer, and motivator. I also have a blog site called AchieveMeaning.com. Thank you. And you're on, Jane. Hey, my name is Jane Dracitis, and I am also a resident of the Villages, have been for 10 years. And this evening, I'm representing a program that's called Ageless Great. And I want to start out first asking you a rhetorical question, but I want you to think about it. If I ask, or if I say to you, use it or lose it, what does that mean to you? Frequently, we think about our physical ability. We're a loss of muscle tone, of strength, of flexibility. It could also mean the loss of agility, balance. Many things can happen if we don't keep our body in a good fit condition. But it also impacts our brain. And what happens when we don't use our brain in new and creative ways? Well, sometimes we lose our analytical ability. At the worst case scenario, it could mean that we lose our ability to communicate with our family. We lose the ability to plan, to think. And sometimes people say, well, I, you know, I have a cure for that. Just as physical exercise is a cure for, I want to, as a cure for our physical agility, people like to do brain games, Sudoku, crossword puzzles. But I challenge you, I, I, and I'm a Sudoku player. I play, I do about three puzzles a day, honestly. But you know what? I apply the same logic to every single Sudoku game, just as um, a crossword puzzle. It all depends upon your memory or recall, how much you've traveled. You're using the same skills over and over again. So what I am going to talk a little bit about today is a program called Ageless Grace, which is billed as a brain and body fitness program. It's a program that will work both your body and your mind, and it's fun. You know, when was the last time you went down to the, the square? I know, mid-March of this year, you know, and dance. Didn't we, you, moving is wonderful. It, it stimulates our body, it gives us a good mood, makes us feel good. Years ago, neuroscientists used to think, well, let me backtrack just a second. Neuroscience tells us that when we're kids, when we learn how to play baseball or how to soft boil an egg or the first time we go roller skating or ice skating or ride a bicycle, we are actually developing our brains to be the adults that we have become today. But at the time I was growing up, I was told that our brain had a limited capacity for growth. And in fact, I was, I went to parochial school. I was told if you smoke a cigarette, you're gonna lose, you know, a thousand uh, brain cells. And heaven forbid, if you have two drinks, you're gonna lose 40,000 brain cells and you'll never get them back. Well, the truth is that 
recent neuroscience has learned that our body is capable of building new neural pathways and increasing our brain capacity. And the, the point that I used to, I really like making is with stroke victims, it used to be when a person had a stroke, they would work on the, the best functioning side of the body to build it up, to allow it to, uh, to do the things that the, the damaged side can't do any longer. Well, now stroke victims, if they have a weak side, that side is tied behind their back or the good side, I should say, the strong side is tied behind their back and they're made to exercise with the weaker side. Now, the neural pathways will not, will not recreate a part of the brain that goes dead after a stroke, but it will allow the neural pathways to work around that damaged part of the brain so that the person will get full capacity or near full capacity um, following the stroke. So it's a really exciting time for neuroscience. And I have the privilege of being trained by a woman by the name of Denise Medved, who has a program called Ageless Grace. And this Ageless Grace program combines body movement and, and, brain, um, and brain stimulation for overall body fitness and health for long-term growth and long-term uh, abilities. Now, I've been doing this program since 2017. I was certified in 2017, and every year I have to be recertified. And I will tell you that today I had a virtual conversation with my doctor who was reading me my, my blood results, all right? So I have been doing this program uh, since, well, since 2017. But since we've been on shutdown, I have been doing it just 10 minutes a day, every day, uh, every day of the week. And my, I have, I'm on no prescription drugs. I graduated grade school in, in uh, 1960. I won't tell you how old I am, but you can maybe figure it out, use your brain. I graduated grade school in 1960 and I weigh six pounds more than I did when I graduated from grade school. And about nine pounds more than I did when I graduated from high school. So I've maintained my body weight. I'm on no prescription drugs except something for my thyroid. My cholesterol today was 190. And I'm saying that it's because I am doing this regularly every day to maintain my body and brain fitness. Now I've been teaching this class in the villages and people have told me that um, I had one woman approach me and say, you know, after three times of, in your class, I think my husband, could he possibly be serious? He's telling me my memory is better. Good point. I've had other people tell me that after an hour class, they go home and they can clean their house and they can go grocery shopping and they have the energy that they haven't had before the program. So it's a fun class. Denise has created a, a program with 21 tools. They have Cute names, Juicy Joints, Front Row Orchestra, Dive In, Rock and Rockettes, uh, Dance Party, Tri Chi, Body Math, uh, Gentle Geometry. All the tools are done to music and they're all done seated. Now, you might say, seated, what kind of exercise program is that? Well, because it's a, a brain fitness program, it's done seated because our body is not used to moving seated and dancing and, and stretching and doing different motions. So it works, it works our core better and it works the connection between our, our core and our brain. So we're getting a complete workout. Um, I'd like to encourage you, if you would like to try it, uh, you can learn more about it at www.agelessgrace.com. Um, and as soon as we're open up in the villages again, I will be teaching it. I've also taught it at Elan, at assisted living there. I've taught it uh, in people's homes when a gentleman had a stroke and his wife wanted him to get some good exercise in the house without going out. And I've done that. Um, but it's fun. The music is fun. Uh, the energy is great. It's just like you've finished an evening dancing at the square. So, um, I think that's all that I want to talk about. But I, one final um, remark is that there are five functions of the brain that moving your body impacts. And the 
All five functions are very important as we age, and that's the strategic thinking function, our memory and recall, our analytical thinking, our um, creativity, and also our kinesthetic learning. So by moving the body, we are able to impact these functions in our brain. So, you know, use it or lose it, um, try it out, and I think the results will be very positive for you, as they have been for me. Thank you. And on the side, you'll see a, a letter or two, and then about three or four numbers. And that's the aircraft registration number. And if that aircraft starts with N, as in November, you know that it's a U.S. registered airplane. So the next time you go flying, be sure to look and see if it's a U.S. registered airplane. I said, that's really very, very important. He said, well, why? And I said, well, actually, the U.S. leads in aviation. And if it's a November registered airplane, you know that it has more uh, mechanic checks. It has inspections. I said, in fact, before we left Narita tonight, they had a FAA certified mechanic take about 20 minutes and he did a walk around the airplane, the entire airplane to make sure it's airworthy. We do that in the US, not all companies do that. So we have really trained, trained um, mechanics and also the airplanes are checked and rechecked. Another thing about uh, US airplanes is our flight attendants. Uh, flight attendant training is six to eight weeks. All of our flight attendants are fully certified in CPR, the certified, F, uh, certified first aid if you need that. And also they have a physical check to make sure that they can open the doors and windows in case of emergency. And every year the flight attendants have to get recertified. They also have some mental and emotional tests that they have to pass. So we're very stringent about that. And then lastly, the pilots. I can definitely speak to that. The U.S. registered airplanes have FAA certified pilots. FAA is Federal Aviation Administration. And so as a pilot, every six months, we have to have training. We have two days of training. First day is ground school where we talk about the airplane. We're given tests about the airplane. If there were an airplane accident around the world, we discuss that accident. You know, what happened, why did it happen, and how we could preclude this from happening again. And then the second day of training, we uh, jump in a simulator and we actually do some flights and in routes and approaches and landings and so on. Every six months we have that training. In addition, we have an FAA medical that we have to pass every six months. A full medical as well as a very comprehensive eye test because as a pilot, you must have 20-20 vision. You can have it corrected vision with uh, contacts or glasses, but you must maintain a 20-20 vision. So the pilots are also really uh, checked in the November registered airplanes. And he said, yeah, but you know, some of my friends, they fly those Asian airplanes and they tell me how beautiful the airplane is on the inside and how all the flight attendants are basically under 30 years old. And the food, well, it's pretty good too. Well, now we don't get food, right? But then we did get food. And he said, you know, I thought that that might be more comfortable to fly in. I said, well, it may. However, consider this. If you're in an emergency situation, would you rather have a well-trained crew or would you rather have a good meal? <laughs> and he said, yeah, yeah, okay, you make a lot of sense. I, and he kind of smiled and I could see that he was getting a little more relaxed. And so I was uh, really happy about that, that he was thinking about uh, that. And I said, well, uh, uh, one more fact. And I said, I know whenever you're in a situation, you might not like, you know, so many facts, but just please think about this. The National Transportation Safety Board in 2015 said, that there were over 35,000 vehicle fatalities. That's, you know, car accidents and 35,000 sadly died. In 2015 in airplanes, we had 2020 commercial airplane accidents. However, no fatalities. So you can see by the, uh, how safe it is to fly. Flying is so much safer 
than driving a car. And so I could kind of see he was relaxing and resting. And so I said, well, hey, thanks for listening. He said, no, thank you. I, I'd be interested in learning more about the fear of flying. I feel a little better. And he must have felt a little better because then he immediately uh, ordered a beer. <laughs> so I thought my job is done. Actually, I've been a pilot uh, really all my life and I flew for Continental Airlines. I was really uh, uh, honored to be a pilot with them on their largest airplane, the Boeing 747, and I flew around the world. Also, I teach what's called a pinch hitters course. And I did that even when I was talking to him. He didn't really know that I had that. But basically, I taught the non-flying pilot in a small airplane how to fly the airplane in case the pilot would have a heart attack, an emergency of some kind, how they can fly. So aviation, every aspect of it, I worked for 30 plus years. I love, love airplanes. As I said, I never met an airplane I didn't love. Fortunately, I'm going to be teaching uh, in uh, November and January of next uh, year uh, for the Enrichment Academy here. I'm going to be teaching a fear flying class. So uh, please remember that. And if you'd like to come out, and I, we're, we'll have a good time over that. So again, my name is Tweet Coleman. My website is tweetcoleman.com. Hope to hear from you uh, one way or another. If I see you in the store, be sure to introduce yourself. Welcome aboard. Okay, Jill, go right ahead. Well, hello everybody. I'm a little bit different than most of the people here because I am an artist. Um, I've had three jobs in my life also. My first job is I was a healthcare administrator. I took care of old people for about 15 years in the inner city in Baltimore, Maryland. I was one of the first women ever to be licensed in Baltimore, Maryland. As a matter of fact, I passed my state and federal boards the first time around and they wouldn't give me my license because I was a female. But it was probably a good thing because I was 22 years old and I wasn't ready. So I had lunch with some administrator in Annapolis, Maryland for about two months and they gave me my license and I became an assistant administrator. But one thing that it did teach me back then is I learned how to fix it. I learned how to make it happen. When outcome-oriented surveys came in and old people and nursing homes were supposed to get better, I had had enough. So I joined my family in the camping business for 20 some years. I ran summer camps and, and 10 years before I left that business, I joined forces with Washington Children's Hospital. They brought in a different disability every week. Um, I was able to mainstream these children with, other, with the regular children and give them a normal experience. So I left there about three years ago because I had had enough. I was tired of going to West Virginia for six months a year. And I went to Charlotte, North Carolina, met my husband there, he was a public adjuster. I became a public adjuster. I became one of the best ones in Charlotte and I had a lot of problems with the health insurance companies. I was so successful, 99% of my claims got approved and I took care of people, but it was always a fight and I just didn't, I was tired of fighting. So I came down here to the villages because my husband got a job here and I said, what am I going to do now? I've always worked 60, 70 hours a week. I can't just retire. I'm not that kind of person. When my children were going through adolescence, I knew that I needed to do something creative. I needed to zone out and not think about what was happening. And I studied with a master painter for 25 years in Maryland. I also used to travel a lot when I was in the summer camping business. I brought children over from Europe to learn American English, but I spent a lot of time in Paris and I saw this art called Papier Toll, which is a multi-dimensional paper art. I, came, I decided that I needed to perfect it. And if you talk to any of my friends, they will tell you Jill's the one to go to to make it happen. So I studied with a master painter for 25 years, learned to oil paint, learned to master this art. And I came down to the villages. And I realized that the people here at the villages, they could use this art. They um, most of their art classes are an hour and a half long. Um, and then they're done. Everybody makes the same thing and they're all stressed because they had to get to the finish line. So I started this and today, for example, and I'm gonna turn the camera, hopefully, here. Let me see if I can get it. Okay, a woman came to my class today. She told me that she wanted to make a picture with her dogs. She has stage four cancer. 
I said, okay, and these are her dogs on the right, by the way. I said, let's get a bookshelf and a sofa and we'll build out your dogs and we'll put them on the sofa. So I got online and I got, excuse me a second, I got online and I, as I always do, and I also always um, put these things, these templates together for these people because I've learned I don't want them to get frustrated. So we created this bookshelf, then we created the sofa, as you can see, and next week she will be coming and we will be building out the dogs and putting them on the sofa. People come to my classes and they stay for four hours. They don't even know where the time went. Here is another picture and I'm waiting for the big bubble and the hair is real and this is built out. Here's one that a woman made in the lab and the people that work in my classes, come to my classes, have never done anything before in their life. They're not creative. I make it so they're successful. I put together these kids and these templates after talking to them and I sit next to them and we build out their pictures and they create something that's unique, that's different than anybody else and they can hang it on their wall as a conversation piece. But the best thing about this is they feel good about it. They feel good about themselves and they feel good about what they did. Here is one that is a poker game. I picked up this um, poster in Paris and I built that out. And what I, I'm going to show you just a couple minutes because we don't have a lot of time. But this is, the picture starts as a flat picture. It's just a paper picture. And I wire pieces and then I start to put them together. So for example, this piece here would get glued with silicone glue on top of there. This piece here would get glued on top of here. This piece here would be glued on top of here. This piece here would be glued on top of there. Then there's another one that would be glued here. There would be another one that is glued here. Oops, excuse me. Let's see here. This one goes over to here, etc. It is an amazing art. It, um, people are with me for three or four hours at a time. I don't care. I'm gonna turn myself back around. I don't care how long it takes them to complete their picture. They can come. I teach out at the Village Art Center. I also teach at Gilda Matilda's. And I'll teach one-on-one -on -one for people that have um, stage four cancer or recent stroke patients. I'm gonna show you one more. This is an elaborate one. This is a New York stock market, if I can get it in there. I don't know if you guys can see it or not, but it is many different layers with wooden balsas, but that's for very um, experienced people. What I'm trying to say, is a oh, second hold on one second please everybody is successful everybody um it, it, it everybody's successful everybody's relaxed everybody goes home with a wonderful piece of art and they can't believe that they created it and i've i realize now what an asset i am to the villages and to the people here i don't teach any more than eight people at a time at the village art center i started one day a week I'm there two days a week. I'm going to be adding three days a week. I'm at Gilda Matilda's on Friday. And it is a wonderful therapy for anybody that takes the class because they don't realize how great they are, but it also, they zone out. They don't think they're not watching Fox News. They're not thinking about this pandemic. They're not thinking about the election. They're not thinking about their, their husband that recently passed away or the, di or the different things that they have to do. They're just thinking, they're zoning out and creating something beautiful and it just makes them happy and relaxed. And I am really happy that I came here and I started my fourth career. And that's what I have to say. All right, go right ahead, Elid. Okay. There was a man who liked fishing. He lived in the villages and he heard of a stream where you could catch big fish. So he was new to the villages. He went down to the stream and he threw his line in time after time and never got a bite. He happened to look downstream and there was a really old guy just pulling in the fish and then he would take it off the hook and throw it back in again. The man looked a little bit closer and he saw that it was apparent that the older guy was measuring the fish and then throwing it back in. 
being a new fisherman to the village's area, he thought, I'd better go down and find out if there's some limit on the size we can catch or if I'm following the rules. And also, why is he catching so much fish and I'm not catching any at all? So he picked up his gear, walked down to the gentleman and said, sir, I noticed you're catching a lot of fish. And the older gentleman said, oh yeah, I've lived around here for years. I was born in home of Sasa. I know where all the big fish are. And the new fisherman said, well, that's interesting. I'm, I'm looking and you have a ruler there and it's just broken off at about seven inches. And I see you catching a fish and holding the fish up against the ruler and if it's bigger than the ruler, you throw it back. Is, is there a seven inch limit? And the old guy said, no, not at all. And the new fisherman said, then why are you throwing all those big fish back? And the old guy said, well, you see, that seven inches on that ruler is exactly the size of my frying pan. Now I ask each of you, is your frying pan big enough? Are you throwing back all the big fish? Are you by any chance ignoring all the possibilities that exist for you in this life? That old fisherman just didn't have vision. Why didn't he buy a bigger frying pan and have more fish? Well, we don't know. Helen Keller, who lost her sight and her speech at age two, suddenly was plunged into a world of darkness. She lost her speech and her hearing, excuse me. And she was plunged into a world of silence and darkness. Yet she imagined and managed to graduate from Radcliffe College. She became a writer for the New York Times. She actually founded the ACLU. Now, we're not getting political, don't get excited, but back in those days, the ACLU was a very, very honored institution, as it is by some people today. Now, how did she do that? One of her very famous quotes is this. The only thing worse than being blind is to have sight and no vision. She had vision. She had imagination. Now, what does this mean to you? Why is this important to you? No matter what your age, whether you're eight, 40, 60, 80, or even 100, you still have dreams left in you. And I bet if I asked you, what are your dreams? What are your big dreams? 65%, which the statistics show is correct, would say, I don't know. I don't know. I used to have dreams. I just don't have them anymore. I don't know what happened to them. I'm urging you today to consider dreaming because it does increase your lifespan. Dreaming gives you a purpose, and dreaming builds and ignites your passion. Now, how do you get to your dreams? You really can achieve them, and that does take the vision. That's what I'm talking about tonight, having a vision for your life. Design your life. Don't let it just happen to you. You're going to create a life a year from now, two years from now, but it may not be what you want. It may actually be the same life as last year and the year before. If you start dreaming and create a vision of the life you would love to live, your life becomes purposeful and exciting. You have something to get up in the morning for. 
the three parts to dream building. And by the way, I do teach a course called the Dream Builder course here in the villages. And the results are awesome. They're amazing. But the three parts are, first of all, dream. You got to have a dream. And then design your dream. Now I'm talking about being specific. If you want a new house, you decide how many bedrooms you want, how many bathrooms, do you want a pool, what color are the walls, be specific because the universe likes specifics. Let me ask you, would you call up Macy's and say, hi Macy's, let me just give you my credit card and my billing address and you just send me something you think I'd like. Now would you do that? No, you would tell them what size shoes or if you wanted to dress or if you wanted pots and pans. So the second part to the dream builder method is design and be specific. The third part is decide. Decide that you're going to go for that dream. Decide because until you are committed, nothing happens. Until one is committed, there is hesitancy and the chance to draw back. But the moment you become committed, it's really strange. Providence moves in and all sorts of things start to occur that otherwise never would have occurred. There's a saying by the German philosopher Goethe, and it's this, whatever you can do or dream you can do, do it now because boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. And so do you. Therefore, I urge you tonight to follow the Dream Builder steps, consider signing up for a course, and consider having me speak to your group about leaving a legacy. And first, in order to leave that legacy they want, they must have a vision of their life at least three years from now. I'm Elin Mayer. My website is werockyourdream.com and I'd love to get your emails. It's elin at mayormotivations.com.